Should I go first? All right. First of all, I understand this is on C-SPAN, which is good, because I can tell my mom the roast beef sandwich is in the crisper. <laughs> I have to hide it from my father. Um, so my book is called uh, Israel is Real, which is from a t-shirt that was very popular uh, when I was a kid, and I liked it because it had this kind of dual meaning, which is it's just like a little play on words, but it also, I thought, expressed this idea that Israel had, in a sense, not been real, and that you couldn't get on a plane and go there for 2,000 years, um, and then in the lifetime of my father, it became real again. And I have sort of a rule with books, which is I try to, if I try to go find a book to read and I can't find it, then I try to write it. And basically I felt like with this topic, everything about Israel was so political and it was so much about the argument, and I felt that when the argument started, sort of the story was lost. And what I was interested in doing was sort of getting back some of the epic quality, some of the poetry, and some of the really amazing strangeness of the story of Israel, not just as a nation, but as an idea. Um, I grew up in the Midwest, and I went to a synagogue uh, in Glencoe, Illinois, where the Judaism we were taught was good and also sort of boring. And I felt that, like, in a way, it had been intentionally made boring, because I always thought it was a sort of assimilation thing. So that if a Christian happened into our synagogue, they would go, oh, this looks familiar to us. No problem here. Carry on as you were. And um, to, to some extent, what I wanted to do with the book was kind of make uh, Jewish history strange again and um, really get into all the details of all the different people. And um, basically, I wanted to sort of answer some of the very simple questions that I felt were never asked and never answered when I was a kid, maybe so simple that people didn't ask them. And those were questions like, uh, who was the first Zionist? You know, Theodore Herzl wrote the book, The Jewish State, and is considered the father of modern Zionism, but there were people before him. Who were they? Also, if Jewish life in Europe was so terrible, why did it take so long for there to be a modern state of Israel? Why did it take all those years for it to happen? And what is sort of the existence of Israel mean, and how has it changed uh, what it means to be Jewish everywhere. And um, I very much wanted to tell this through individual characters, people that I thought were important at different individual eras. And, um, and I really saw it as kind of like a painting, if you've ever seen like those Chuck Close paintings where when you get right up close, it looks like there's all these little individual pictures, but when you step back, you realize all the little individual pictures together make one big picture. And that's sort of how I saw my book, and it's sort of how I see uh, Jewish history and what I was trying to do. Um, something I was very interested in uh, were uh, false messiahs from the Middle Ages because to me this group of people that every generation in the Middle Ages in Europe rose up and said I'm the Messiah of the Jews, follow me and I'm going to lead you back and we're going to rebuild the temple were exotic, hard to understand figures but in another way were completely understandable because they were scrubbed of the religious language, they were sort of proto-Zionists. And um, I was going to read something from the book very quickly, and it was about my favorite false messiah. And you can have a favorite false messiah like you have a favorite band or anything else, and I'm actually thinking of putting out false messiah trading cards. Um, think of David Al Roy, one of the many false messiahs that stud Jewish history. He was crazy every day from the moment he got up to the moment he laid down. But it was a kind of crazy that is captivating, convincing. He was born in Amidia, a Muslim garrison town in what is now Kurdistan. His given name was Menachem, but he renamed himself David around 1160 when he began to prophesy, follow me to Jerusalem, redemption is at hand. He went from town to town, synagogue to synagogue, spreading the news. His words were electric. They made people as drunk as wine. Men gave away their possessions and joined him. Of course, Anyone can call himself the Messiah and announce the end of time, and many do. In fact, as I sit in my apartment on Broadway, on the west side of Manhattan, a man walks in the street below calling for me and the other people in my building to cast aside our jobs and follow him, because the end is now. We call this man Broadway Jesus. He's in the street every day, and though he's persistent, I do not follow him, because I am busy and he is crazy. 
What makes a false messiah notable, after all, is not the false part, but the messiah part. To be a false messiah, you must be a real messiah first. You must be even more charismatic than a real messiah who is with God, whereas a false messiah is alone. You must convince people you have the answer, that there is an urgency in what you say. Your words and your manner must carry me out of my life against my better judgment. This is what turns the run-of-the-mill Broadway Jesus into a messiah. And it's precisely this quality that cannot be captured in written accounts, which is why stories about people like David Al Roy, who one day was alone and the next day was surrounded by men who had forsaken everything, are so hard to understand. The missing piece is the only piece that matters, that wild spark or gleam that people follow as the Hebrews followed the column of fire through the desert. Alroy sent long, intricate letters to the leaders of the Jewish communities in Baghdad and Mosul, in which he urged them to take up arms, cross the wastes, and join him. Thousands came. They called him the King of the Jews. We don't know what he looked like. He lived in a Muslim world where image-making was a sin. This is thought to be an obstacle, but I think it's a boon. A picture is a moment in a sea of moments, so it distorts as much as it reveals. Attila the Hun is more vivid without a picture, as is King David, as is Crazy Horse. In a picture, David Al Roy would be a stiff figure in period costume. Without it, he is wild-haired, with happy eyes, and dressed in a suit pulled from a dumpster on Skid Row. He stands in the street screaming, your father's horde after goat demons. He said he would attack the garrison in Amidia, drive out the Arabs and purify the town, then lead his ragged army to Palestine. In old books, his story builds until the tension is unbearable. Then, soon after he sounds the battle cry, his army is gone, he is gone. It's a story without a finish. According to most scholars, this probably means the rebellion was crushed and Alroy executed. Over the years, myths were invented to explain what might have happened or should have happened. In other words, people wrote their own ending. In some, Alroy is killed. In some, he is captured. In some, he flees to Jerusalem. In some, he wanders the streets weeping and crying, Absalom, O oh Absalom. In some, he vanishes into the hills. In some, he falls in, love with, falls in with the group of highwaymen. In some, he falls in love, but his love is unrequited. In some, he survives and gets married and realizes too late that he has married the wrong woman. In some, he is a glutton and grows fat and tells his story, but no one believes it's him. In some, he gives up his destiny for a happy life of not worrying about the Jews. Alroy became a fantastic figure in the imagination of his people. Dozens of stories have been written, but the most ter terrific was recorded by Benjamin Tudela, a Jewish merchant who kept a diary during his travels in the East. He's sometimes called the Jewish Marco Polo. Tudela was in Kurdistan soon after the disappearance of Alroy and heard the story everywhere. In the most frequent telling, Alroy, at the height of his fame, is summoned to Damascus by the caliph. He is made to stand as the caliph smokes a hookah, exhaling great streams of cool white smoke. Through half-closed eyes, the caliph asks, Are you the king of the Jews? It is as you say, says Alroy. The caliph calls a guard who shackles Alroy and locks him in a cage. The next day, while the caliph is meeting his advisors, discussing what should be done with the heretic, Alroy himself appears in the room. He has broken free of his chains and walked through the bars. He is Harry Houdini, or Harry Houdini, a Jew from Appleton, Wisconsin, whose real name was Eric Weiss, was an echo of David Alroy, the mercurial Jew in possession of the dark knowledge. The caliph ordered his guards to seize Alroy, but Alroy disappears. He is seen again hours later on the outskirts of Damascus. He is chased by a soldier. When Alroy reaches the river he, and is seemingly trapped, he turns his prayer shawl into a raft and sails away to freedom. That evening, he miraculously turns up in Amidia, a 10-day ride from Damascus. He speaks with his followers, asking each of them, do you know me, then vanishes. The caliph, hearing this, threatens to kill every Jew in Arabia if Al Roy is not turned over. The mayor of Amidia bribes Al Roy's father-in-law who kills the Messiah in his sleep. David Al Roy was the first superhero. He was a caped crusader, only his cape was a prayer shawl, and his crusade was Zion. He was a prototype of the Jewish cultural heroes of later generations, the Jewish sports star and the Jewish gangster. 
He offered a picture of strength to a people lousy with weakness. He was a model, consciously or not, for Superman, created in 1938, another dark age for the Jews, by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, Jewish teenagers from Cleveland, Ohio.